My name is Joan Bauck. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to go ahead at the bottom of your screen, you will see the mute button. Go ahead and mute yourself for now. You can keep your video on if you would like um, or stop sharing your video, that's fine. I also mentioned already that we have the chat button at the bottom. And as Casey is speaking this evening, you are welcome to type your questions into the chat or you can write them down. And when she is finished speaking, we'll have a question and answer period. Um, my name is Joan Bauck. I'm one of the adult programming librarians at the St. Mary's County Library. Uh, this is one of our Meet the Author programs and we are very thrilled to have Casey Sepp with us. She is a Maryland author. We, as some of you know, we've opened the new Leonardtown Library. We had planned on doing that in April, so we wanted to get a lineup of Maryland authors. And now that it's November, we are getting to meet Casey. Uh, Casey is the author of Furious Hours, and it's Mur Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee. And you can see all these uh, little sticky notes that I've put in. I have all these questions for Casey this evening. Casey lives on the Eastern Shore. She was a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. And she has written this amazing book. If you haven't had a chance to read it yet, I recommend that you get your copy at the library or you can purchase a copy at the White Rabbit in California, Maryland. And with that, uh, Casey, you can take it away. Sure, thanks so much for having me, Joan. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't come to the library in person. Actually, one of my favorite events, so my book came out in hardback last year and Joan was just holding up the paperback, but. One of my favorite events was at the public library in Easton, so the Talba County Free Library, which was, you know, near and dear to my heart as a kid and just one of the most important institutions in my life. And it was so much fun and such a fine reminder of the way that the library really is the heart of a community. And, you know, my teachers were there and people who, my mom's a mail carrier, so half of her mail route was there. And my dad worked at AMP for a long time, so all of his customers were there, and just such a fine institution. And I look forward to seeing the new library and coming to visit in person sometime. But for now, I'm glad that you all are online and keeping people safe. And um, it's it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think that you know we had said maybe I would just kind of give a summary of the book because there's obviously no expectation that anyone in the chat with us has read it. <laughs> um, so. I, I would love to just say a few words about, you know, kind of how I found my way to this story and what it was like to work on the book and just give a give a tiny precy of what the kind of plot is. And I said that I grew up in Easton, right outside of Easton, actually, and, you know, came through the Taubic County Public Schools. And if any of you have been to that part of the shore, it won't surprise you to learn that, you know, growing up there, Mockingbird was one of my favorite books. And I, you know, it's probably harder to see now, but I looked a lot like the actress who played Scout in the movie. And my father wasn't a lawyer, but I worshiped him. And I just loved that book. And the courthouse right there in Easton actually looks a lot like what we're led to believe the courthouse in Maycomb looks like. You know, there's a beautiful cupola, beautiful brick building, center of town. And just a kind of pivotal space in the community. So I love that book and I had always wanted to see Monroeville, which is the real life Maycomb, you know, the place where Harper Lee was born and raised, the town that had made her into a writer and the town that she had turned into Maycomb when she worked on that novel. And I had been wanting to go for years and had done a couple of road trips, you know, south to Georgia, south to Florida, but I had never made my way to Alabama. And I jumped in 2015, when the New Yorker, the magazine I worked for, you know, was asking, you know, for someone to go down and write about Harper Lee. And that was because there had been this surprising announcement that Harper Lee, who for decades had said she was never going to publish another book, would be publishing a new novel. And, you know, if you're Harper Lee fans and you're watching, you remember that was Ghosts at a Watchman. And there was a lot of confusion about that book, um, concern about the provenance of the manuscript, concerns about Harper Lee's mental well-being and her ability to consent to publication and concerns about kind of the financial situation of her affairs and who was making the decisions, who was benefiting from them financially. And anyhow, I went down to Monroeville and I spent 
two weeks down there, meeting people, interviewing people who knew Harper Lee, learning about that community, learning about the new lawyer who was in charge of her affairs. And I wrote one story for The New Yorker about Ghost at a Watchman. But while I was down there, I found out about this other book that Harper Lee had worked on in the 70s and in the 80s. And it was absolutely surprising to me, especially, I felt like I knew Harper Lee, but here was this true crime project, this nonfiction project that had really consumed her. For nine months, she moved to this town, um, not, not around Monroeville, about two and a half hours away over in Eastern Alabama, not far from Georgia. She moved into this town. She attended at some criminal trials. She interviewed a bunch of law enforcement officers, interviewed lawyers, interviewed relatives of the victims of these murders. And she had planned to write a book about a man named um, Willie Maxwell. And Willie Maxwell was a Baptist minister who, um, you know, worked in a couple of different parishes and was renowned in that part of Alabama for his preaching and, you know, presided over weddings, presided over funerals, had this kind of reputation around town for his eloquence and his extemporaneous preaching. And that was his primary reputation until 1970 when he was accused of killing his first wife. And I say first wife because in 1972, he would be accused of murdering his second wife. And by 1977, he had been accused of murdering a brother, a nephew, and a stepdaughter. And all five of those murders, the motive was um, life insurance fraud. He held policies on all those individuals, sometimes a dozen policies on the same person. And he had insured many other family members and you know, there were police investigations, but he was never convicted of those crimes. And in 1977, at the funeral of that stepdaughter, which was a shocking crime in its own right, a 16-year-old found dead on the side of the road. Um, like all of the other earlier deaths, hers had been staged to look like a car accident, but the Alabama Bureau of Investigation really thought it was just that, a staged crime scene. It had been made to look like she was changing a tire, but she was had been asphyxiated before she was put under the, the truck. You know, there were all of these suspicious circumstances, and yet, you know, the police had not brought any charges a week later at her funeral. And so a relative of her stood up and shot and killed the Reverend in cold blood in the funeral home. 300 people watched it happen. And that's kind of the moment Harper Lee found out about this story in 1977. And she got interested primarily because the Reverend's lawyer, a man named Tom Radney, um, who had represented the Reverend for 10 years in all of those criminal investigations and then all of the civil, inv civil cases too, because you know, the police were upset about these crimes, but the life insurance companies were apoplectic and they had tried to stop payment and they had tried to sever their ties with the Reverend. And Tom Radney had been the Reverend's lawyer through both the criminal and the civil cases. And in 1977, when his client, the Reverend Willie Maxwell died, he took on the case of the vigilante who had murdered him. And so Harper Lee met Tom Radney, got interested in his story, came to town, attended the trial of the vigilante. And as I said, spent nine months doing all of the same kind of investigative reporting that I did for the book. You know, did all the interviews, got all the documents. And what I learned in 2015 when I was down in Alabama was, you know, there was a real mystery about what the heck had happened to the book she was working on. You know, was it Ghost at a Watchman and she'd finished it and there was a manuscript somewhere to be discovered? Um, was it like some of the other novels she had undertaken in the 1960s where she started and gave up? You know, what the heck had happened was the real question about her work on that case. Um, and so that's that's the origins of my book. You know, I loved Harper Lee, was hoping to learn more about her life. Um, because of Watchmen and because of her death in 2016, a lot of people who had not been willing to speak about her suddenly were willing to give interviews or to share their letters or to speak candidly about this giant of American literature. And so the way my book works is actually, it's, it's only the last third is about Harper Lee. Um, so I sometimes joke, you know, if you're in it for Harper Lee, you've got to be kind of patient. She's in the prologue, you meet her. I tell you about her attending the trial in 1977. But then I spend the first third of the book, you know, walking through those original murder cases. So you learn about the Reverend Willie Maxwell and his story. And then the second third of the book is about Tom Radney, his lawyer, who was an absolutely fascinating small town lawyer, kind of a Matlock figure, you know, in his own mind thought he was a kind of Atticus Finch figure. Um, but he also had this absolutely fascinating political career. He was a Kennedy liberal in the Wallace years in Alabama. So I tell you a little bit about the political scene, which coincidentally is the one that Harper Lee came of age in. 
um, you know, this, these, these are the things she was reading, these are the politicians she was following. So there's a bit of a concurrence between her and Tom and, and eventually we get to her part of the book. Um, so it's divided into those three main characters and obviously they have this point of intersection, but three very different lives, you know, race, gender, socioeconomic status, they exercised, you know, control of the world in very different ways. The Reverend story is very much about religion, both the, the ministry he was involved in in the Baptist church, but not surprisingly, there were a lot of rumors about how the Reverend could get away with all of this. And the conclusion of many members of the community around this part of Alabama was that he was a voodoo priest. And so there's a little bit about voodoo and hoodoo and root working and kind of that, that aspect of Southern religion and, you know, there's no evidence that he was a practitioner of any of those forms of religion, but I give you a little bit of a history about why people believed he might have been and about, um, you know, some of the real life practitioners of, of those uh, syncretic practices, you know, plenty of Christians kind of dabbled in those kinds of um, hoodoo practices too, and there was always a kind of syncretism between Christianity and, and voodoo, especially in the Caribbean and um, in the early arrival of some of the enslaved persons in the American South. So there's a little bit of, you know, religious history when it comes to the Reverend. You learn a little bit about life insurance, you know, how the industry developed, how the Reverend could take out these policies, you know, how he got away with it, such as it, such as it was. And then you move on to Tom Radney, where you're, if you're interested in politics, I love kind of American history and political history. So you learn about that. Um, and then when it comes to Harper Lee, you know, she's someone who obviously storytelling was the, the heart and soul of her world. And I tell you how she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, how she wrote Go Set a Waspman and the relationship between those two books. But also, if you, if you didn't know it, some about her time in Kansas. Um, she went out to Kansas with her childhood friend, Truman Capote. And so I tell you a little bit about kind of how she learned about true crime reporting and her own education in the law. Um, she nearly finished a degree in, in, in law at the University of Alabama before she dropped out. So she had real chops when it came to this kind of work. And then, of course, the payoff, I think, in the book or the kind of design such as it is, is that learning everything you can about the murders and about the lawyers and about the figures in the Maxwell case, you're then kind of able to assess the progress Harper Lee made and to follow along in her investigation and understand the conclusions she was drawing about these characters and really making sense of the Maxwell case. Um, so I think that's fun if you're a true crime nut, you know, if you just sit around watching Netflix documentaries and reading true crime, the nice thing about this book is it's a kind of how-to. And I give you all of the information I can about the case so that you can start to evaluate the choices and the frustrations of Harper Lee as she tried to turn it into a book. Um, so those are the kind of three main characters and the kind of themes and, and deeper currents of each section. But, um, you know, for me as a writer, it's just a lot of fun. It was my first book and I, I feel like, you know, it was interesting to sit with three different characters and to get to think about so many different kinds of writing and storytelling. And um, I hope that there's a similar pleasure for, for folks, if you haven't read it, if you're, if you're interested in reading it, um, that, that you get to move around different genres and different characters and, and think in multiple ways about the same story. Um, so I think that's probably enough of an introduction. Again, if you knew nothing about the book, um, just to give you a sense, you know, it is a little bit of a biography of Harper Lee, but with a focus on this true crime story. And, um, you know, the, the value added, I think, is those first two characters who, in their own way, teach you a lot about the world that Harper Lee moved around in and, and the political and the cultural scene from which she throughout the story of Mockingbird, which is, I think, one of the most beautiful and interesting novels in American literary history, certainly in the 20th century. Um, but I hope the book just teaches you more about the woman who wrote it and about her ambitions and about some of the other stories that, that caught her attention, because she was interested in a lot more than just make them. So Joan, I think that's probably enough from me. Um, I know you have some questions and you know, we'll take them from the audience as they come in. And I'm always happy to talk about the research or the reporting or the writing or just um, Life of the New Yorker, because um, that's still where I work. And um, these days, mostly the writing I do is for the magazine. So truly happy to take kind of any and all questions within reason. <laughs> 
I, I could go a, a thousand different directions, but I wanted to mention before before I get off on my tangent, um, were you aware that the uh, To Kill a Mockingbird was the book that was elected as America's best loved book by the Great American Read last year? Yeah, and she was, you know, facing some stiff competition. I think there were some really beautiful and, and powerful novels on that list. And yes, I, I think, you know, it was a coincidence, both that she was at the top of that list and the Broadway adaptation, which probably a lot of folks have seen the cinematic adaptation that came out in 1962, not long after the novel. Right. But there was just a brand new adaptation on Broadway and it was one of the highest grossing plays of the year. So yes. I just think, you know, these are very well loved characters. And I think the real mark of such a fantastic book is that there's always more to say about them. You know, yeah. there's always new interpretation. There's always something to learn. And I think when you read a shallow novel, you kind of read it and you're done. But a deep right. novel like hers, just you can return to it over and over again and think critically about it. And it can bear the weight of criticism and scrutiny. So, well, yeah, I thought that was great. Yeah, and it has so much in it. it there's empathy in it. There's law. There's... Um, how we feel about our community, how we feel about our family. There's so many things that you can address in that book, how we treat others, you know, and you can readdress our times, you know, how, how are we, you know, like when you bring up Black Lives Matter now, and there's so many things that we're facing that you see we were facing when To Kill a Mockingbird was written. So it, it's a wonderful book. Yeah, I think one of my favorite sources when I was working on the book, so obviously, one of the real challenges was Harper Lee was so private and getting people who actually knew her, friends and family, to talk about her. But one of my favorite sources, and I mentioned this woman in the text only because um, crazily Harper Lee had kind of decided this was the woman she wanted to be her biographer, but she extracted this promise that the woman wouldn't start until she died. <laughs> So it was like this, you know, just in pot, golden handcuffs, you know, you are my biographer, but don't do any work on it until I'm dead. And they were almost the same age. And so that was a bit of a challenge. But Claudia Durst Johnson, who was a professor at the University of Alabama, was writing about To Kill a Mockingbird kind of when no other academics were. So starting in the late 70s and early 80s, Claudia was writing these academic articles about the text and taking it seriously as a work of Southern Gothic and, um, you know, as a testament on femininity in the mid-century America and these kind of grand academic ideas. And I was really delighted, you know, Claudia has just put out a book on Ghosts at a Watchman. Okay. And one of the chapters is basically on Black Lives Matter and the question of, you know, what does this book have to say about today and how does it speak to the racial situation of contemporary America? Um, and that's just to say, to your point, you know, the book has really just endured. Right. And you put it in conversation with any number of ideas and, you know, any number of contemporary issues. So I think, you know, if you're someone who's really just a total devotee of Harper Lee, I can't recommend Claudia's book enough that it's, it's a very, it's an academic study and it tra tracks with different themes and takes you through all of the other scholarship that's followed, which um, there's a lot of lawyers who like to write about To Kill a Mockingbird, not surprisingly. <laughs> Right. A lot of law review articles about the ethics of Atticus Finch and about, you know, how the trial unfolds and that kind of thing. So, yeah, if you're just, you know, if you just love Harper Lee and you're just looking for more, 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 um, that woman's name is Claudia Durst Johnson. And she's got two academic books about, um, one about Mockingbird and, and one about Ghost at a Watchman. Okay, I, I've written those down. I, I mean, I, I'm so enthralled now that I've got to read everything I can get my hands on. So I've got it written. Okay, well now I have two questions so far in the chat. So the first one is from Nancy Shank. She said, I really enjoy your New Yorker writing. Your recent profile of Marilyn Robinson was beautiful. How has writing about other writers impacted your work? Gosh, I mean, honest to God, I wish, you know, writing about Harper Lee made me as good a writer as she is. And, you know, hanging out with Marilyn Robinson made me as like smart a person as she is. It's unfortunately not contagious. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, having said that, I do think with both of them, there's always kind of something that the more you spend, the more time you spend thinking about someone's writing in a technical sense, um, I think you can learn a lot. And it's not, it's, it's not, you know, you, you can't just imitate it and you can't just like, it's, it's not a kind of setting, you know, we're, we're not machines. It's not a setting. You can just turn your own kind of 
writing to, to copy it. But I think with Harper Lee, I learned a lot about regionalism. And that's very interesting to me because, you know, I grew up on the Eastern shore. I think of it as a highly distinctive place, but the burden of great writing, I think is always to bring a particular place alive or a particular time to life. And so I thought a lot about that with Harper Lee, and I would like to think that it's something I've really apprenticed myself to her with. Um, so that's, I think there's a kind of particular lesson to learn from her work. Um, and with Marilyn, you know, I actually think that, you know, Marilyn is one of the, the greatest living writers. And I just recommended that academic book about Harper Lee. But if you are looking to just get lost in a beautiful work of prose, I can't recommend any of the Gilead novels enough. And you don't have to start with Gilead. Jack is the one that just came out, but these beautiful books about a small town in Iowa. And there's some of that regionalism. You know, I think you could learn a similar lesson to Harper Lee, but I actually just think that with Marilyn, what was so inspiring about spending time with her, and I tried to communicate this in the profile, but Marilyn is one of the most humane and ethically minded people I've ever met. And I include among that some really, you know, phenomenal preachers and clergy members who I've met. But I think with Marilyn, for me, there was less a lesson about writing, although you can transfer this skill to writing, but Marilyn just made me want to pay attention to other people and to be kind to other people and not just friends and family, but strangers. And, you know, that's kind of this we just came through this incredibly divisive election. And I think for a lot of people, there's a real question about, you know, who are my neighbors and do I understand them? And can I be more empathetic towards them? And so I think with Marilyn, you know, again, that's very useful as a journalist. We should always be listening to people. We should always be looking for stories that don't conform to our prior beliefs. And, you know, we should never impose our beliefs on other people. But I really do feel like with Marilyn, the, the actual um, thing I learned was, really just a kind of patience about other people. And I, I saw it in action, like going out into the world with her, but even just talking to her about people in her life or students of hers. And in some ways, the most miraculous way she does that is with historical figures. You know, I've never met someone who's really just thought so much about the inner life of Abraham Lincoln or John Brown or, you know, John Calvin. And so it's a wonderful question. And I'm not quite sure that I, I, I'm nowhere near a master of it the way that she is, but it really was just inspiring. And I hope that comes across in the profile, just someone who her best advice for us in the world is to be patient with other people and to really, you know, let the world be as beautiful as it is and to let other people be as complicated as they are. Um, so that's a great question. And yeah, I mean, I guess the, the real the, the real shame is, you know, you can profile someone, but it, it doesn't, you, you don't become a carbon copy of them. I wish it were true. I, I would just write about Marilyn for the rest of my life and hope it rubbed off. But um, so far, at least it hasn't. But um, thanks so much for asking. And I do love to write about writers. I think that, you know, we can learn things about craft or about schedules or about research processes. So I'm always interested in that. But um, in the case of Marilyn, I think it's really wonderful to be thinking about her work at a time of great division in, in, the, in the country. Well, even if you can take something, I haven't read anything by Marilyn and I did not read your uh, article on her, but just listening to you makes me want to know her as a as a person or read more about her, but even you as a writer, if you can take something away from everyone that you speak with, that's a beautiful thing. If you can yeah, make, yeah. make a positive that's impact on the world, just because you've interviewed someone and you're sharing it with the rest of us, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I think that's why we're all interested in biography. You know, what I love about this question is like, I think a lot about why we're drawn to certain things and, you know, whether it's like, superhero movies or biography, but I think that's the great hope that, you know, we learn about someone else's life and not that you want to instrumentalize them like, oh, I only care because I can become a better person or, you know, I can improve my business or like become a better husband or whatever. But I do feel like that's why we're interested in other people and especially in exemplary people that you read about your heroes because you want to know how they became themselves or, you know, what they felt like was a good decision or a bad decision or just even how they learn to make decisions. So yeah, I think that's why I've, I always, I love reading profiles. I love writing them and I try to be pretty selective. I mean, I, I think that 
there's a real danger to spending too much time with people who are not laudatory and who do not try and bring out our better angels. You know, we can we can do a lot of rubbish reading and, and learn too much about people who, you know, aren't trying to improve the world or, or be kind to other people. Um, but yeah, I think in the case of Marilyn, you kind of can't do wrong. She's really, she, she, she rewards the time you spend with her and with her work. You can see it in your reaction that, that your time was well spent. Hmm. All right, here's our next one. This is from JD. Our times, um, that's in uh, quotation marks, given what you wrote about her actual father, any comments on the borderline, that's also in qu quotation marks, borderline, as in the DSM definition, that a person is either racist or anti-racist, can't do uppercase due to disability, so typing question mark. I'm not sure... Yeah, I think I, I think I know what, is it JD who asked yeah. that question? Yes. Yeah, JD, that's a great question. And I'm just going to kind of explain for folks who have not been following, who don't know as much about Harper Lee's biography and have not been following the conversation about the character of Atticus Finch. And um, there's a great book. It's, it's a really interesting book. It's called Atticus Finch, A Biography. And it's by a professor at Emory down in Atlanta. And he, his name is um, uh, Joseph Crispino, and Crispino is a historian of the Dixiecrats. He wrote a book about Strom Thurmond, and he followed, you know, a lot of Southern politicians, and he's interested in that kind of moment where the two parties are changing their identities and where the Civil Rights Act is really altering the landscape of American political life. And Joseph Crispino wrote an article about Atticus Finch many years before Ghost at a Watchman was published. And he was speculating that maybe he would have been a Dixiecrat. And that was surprising to people at the time, but it was really a speculation that was affirmed by the publication of Ghost at a Watchman. Because for people who don't know, Ghost at a Watchman was Harper Lee's very first book. Um, she moved to New York in 1949. She was trying to write short stories. She was trying to get a handle on her life as a writer. And when she sat down to produce her first manuscript, it was Ghost at a Watchman. And her agents shopped that book around town in 1957, and no one wanted to publish it. But there was a female editor named Tay Hohoff who said, you know, I don't want to publish this book, but I love the characters. I love the world you're building. And I would like to help you find a book I can publish. And for two and a half years, they revised, they debated, they edited. And that process is what produced To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, so when Ghost Out of Watchmen came out, I know it's confusing because the characters are older and it seems like it's a sequel. It was actually written first. So when it came out, you know, Joseph Crispino read it with great interest and then wrote a whole book about the character of Atticus Finch, who was in fact modeled on Harper Lee's father. Um, his name was A.C. Lee and A.C. Lee ran the newspaper in town. He had been involved in bringing the railroad through Monroe County. He was a prosperous businessman and he apprenticed himself to a lawyer in Monroe County and he was eventually barred and he was a small town lawyer. And, you know, it's not, To Kill a Mockingbird is not an autobiography. You know, it is not a one-to-one, -one, these fictional characters correspond to real life. But of course, Harper Lee was informed by her own story. And to some extent, A.C. Lee was the model for Atticus Finch. And the decisions he made and the cases he took and the outsized role he had in the community as a leader of other, you know, other lawyers and other outstanding members, whether it's in the Chamber of Commerce or, you know, the Masonic Lodge, these civic institutions, that was really true to life. And I think that's why it was so shocking to folks when Ghost Had a Watchman came out that Atticus Finch, who had been for so long upheld as a kind of moral exemplar in this community because of the defense he gave to Tom Robinson, it was devastating to learn that that character, you know, 20 years later was participating in the White Citizens Council, which for those who don't know is the kind of genteel clan. You know, it was a segregationist organization that fought school integration at first, but then integration more broadly. So it was filled with men who, you know, in a kind of crude diagnostic, you could say, you know, didn't want to participate in lynch mobs, but also did not want life to be integrated. So, you know, in, in very overt ways supported segregation and the, you know, oppression of Black Americans um, and wanted to distinguish themselves from the kind of far right of the Klan, but who, you know, were against the NAACP, thought that the Freedom Riders were moving too quickly, thought that court-ordered 
integration was um, unconstitutional and quite possibly merited the kind of response that had heralded um, that had had created the civil war in the 1860s. Um, so extremely divisive organization. And here Harper Lee had written the beloved Atticus Finch right into that role. And it was shocking to people and it raised a lot of eyebrows, but Joseph Crispino's book looks at the ways in which that was Harper Lee coming to terms with her own father's politics. Um, and you know, when I say that a lot of what we know about A.C. Lee has been reconstructed, I told you he owned a newspaper and he was quite a prolific editorial writer. So he often, you know, offered his opinion on the issues of the day, and that included, you know, again, quite shockingly, I think, to folks who assume that A.C. Lee or Atticus Finch would have been marching with MLK, A.C. Lee was, you know, writing to oppose the um, anti-lynching legislation put forward by the federal government. And, you know, some other kind of culturally conservative views on prohibition and um, issues like that, but primarily on racial issues. He was, he was, you know, in keeping with the vision of life put forward in Ghost Out of Watchmen. So a very surprisingly conservative figure. Um, and, you know, and that was A.C. Lee. Those were his editorials. That is the views to which Harper Lee was exposed. And I told you she moved to New York in 1949. And when she moved to New York, you know, New York was mostly an integrated city at that point. Um, you know, not a not a faultless city, not totally integrated, not obviously a place where blacks had full equality yet, nor do they today. But I think that was shocking for the young Harper Lee and the experience of getting on integrated buses where, you know, life hadn't ended. People were living their lives, um, going to integrated movie theaters, all sorts of daily life like that was a real crisis for her. And ongoingly, when she looked back at her father, when she looked back at life in Monroeville, there was a real friction for her between, you know, what was being talked about there and the kind of, you know, cultural cliff people were being warned they would fall over if integration came to pass and the end of civilization as they knew it and, you know, the end of the white race. Here she was in New York seeing that that wasn't the case. So that's the drama of Ghost at a Watchman. And again, if you're interested in those questions, I think that Joseph Crispino's book is really historically rich and historically accurate. And he, I mentioned some of this in my book, but if that's really your, your main interest, he gives you a lot more insight into A.C. Lee and the real figure of Atticus Finch and the real politics of that man, which are very, were very representative of that time and place. Um, and the interesting thing is that by moving to New York, Harper Lee saw a different side of the American political landscape. Um, so I think that it can be a little anachronistic to take some of today's political categories or, um, you know, social constructs and try and decide, like, well, was that Harper Lee or not? Or was that A.C. Lee or not? But what Crispino's book does really well is just take you back to the 1950s, to the 1960s, and look at how life unfolded and what political categories were available to these people. And more specifically, um, you know, what exactly A.C. Lee was opining on. And I think, you know, I mentioned this in my book, and I've given you the kind of A.C. Lee version of things, but it was surprising to me, and I think will be surprising to folks who similarly, you know, idolized To Kill a Mockingbird to learn that in some instances, you know, we know very little about Harper Lee's politics, but the little we know is, is actually pretty surprising and in some instances shocking. So the, the best example of that, and I quoted in the book, is an interview where Harper Lee criticized the Freedom Riders. So, you know, far from being out on the streets, you know, registering voters or marching for the Civil Rights Act, Harper Lee was very critical of the Freedom Riders and said, you know, they were pushing things too quickly and, you know, they were not, they were breaking laws and they were not law abiding. And it was a pretty conservative reaction. Um, now, again, to the point of the anachronism of today's categories and yesterday's categories, you know, that was a majority opinion at the time. It is always easy from today to look back and, and judge the people of the past, but she was in keeping with the majority of, the, of Americans. I think it's just surprising to us because we think of To Kill a Mockingbird as this prescient, clear clarion call for equality, but her own views were a little more nuanced. Um, so I think it's a great question. There is a lot of discussion of her politics insofar as I could suss them out and what people who knew her said and quoting from letters and things like that. But um, I, I just think she is as complicated as A.C. Lee was. Um, but it's a great question. And I think it's one of the things that's just very fruitful for discussion because there is so much to say. And I think these really kind of eternal questions about the relationship between an artist and their art and you know whether 
whether Harper Lee's novel, you know, needed to be as conservative as she was, or, you know, whether the great genius of all great art is that it always exceeds its, the people who create it. Um, and I was just telling Joan before we started, I just finished a piece for the New Yorker about William Faulkner. And, you know, that is someone whose books are, you know, I think a lot, a lot less racist than the man who wrote them. Um, and that give us, you know, similar to Mockingbird, give us a interesting way to talk about, you know, the history of the Confederacy and the history of this country and race relations as a pessimistic or optimistic endeavor. And, you know, the books just are so far to the left of the man who wrote them. Um, and I, I, would, I would be sad to think that the answer is to kind of therefore remove them from syllabi, um, that, that we can't have a conversation about Faulkner and about the books and the relationship between the artists and the art. And same thing for Harper Lee. You know, I, I think that these conversations are richer the more complex they are. And, you know, the, the, the greater the ability we have to actually wrestle with the kind of actual biography of the people who created them. They were never perfect to start with and the kind of sim simplification of authors and their work, um, I, I think is deleterious to the conversations we can have about art. So I was just thinking about that with Faulkner, but Lee's a great example. And there's been a lot of discussion now of um, Flannery O'Connor or, you know, of, of the gender politics of some of the great, it's not only about race, you know, the gender politics of some of the great male writers of the 20th century or the 19th. So I think these things are interesting and important. And A.C. Lee and his daughter, Nell Harper, are, are just a particular example of that. Well, and JD makes the comment. She said, thank you. Your discussion of Faulkner has answered her question. So oh, that's a, yeah, I think, you know, again, it's a great question and it's one, I just think we should be applying to everyone. You know, we, we learn more about ourselves and about the past. And, you know, I don't think that, I, I just think the more complex those discussions are, the better. Um, and, you know, I, I say this funny thing in that Faulkner piece, you guys are getting like a sneak peek of the New Yorker of two weeks from now, but um, I say this funny thing about how, you know, the language around this stuff I think is kind of crude these days. It's like, should we cancel someone? Should we stop reading them? Should we get rid of their books or burn them even in some, you know, kind of overreactions? But um, I say this thing in the piece about how it's too late to cancel William Faulkner because he canceled himself. And, you know, that's a funny line, but the truth is, William Faulkner was extremely suspicious of the kind of cult of the author. And I think he was someone quite burdened by the knowledge that his own politics were insufficient and quite suspicious of the kind of publicity complex that grew up around Hemingway and Fitzgerald. And, um, you know, I think he always thought his books were better than he was. And their great hope. And, you know, he was quite envious of the way that the Elizabethans had a lot of them written anonymously. You know, they published these plays that there were no, there were no authors attributed to them. And Faulkner said, you know, I wish 30 years ago I had never published under my name, that the books had just been anonymous. Because he felt like so much of the kind of ancillary conversation about his views on civil rights or his views on whatever issue, the Cold War, any number of things that unfolded in his lifetime, were a distraction from the pure discussion we could have about the books. And the characters who were so dynamic and the characters who were so complex and could stand outside of those social categories, you know, that's where he wanted people to spend their attention. Which, you know, I told you I love biography. I don't quite buy that 100%, but I lean in the Faulknerian direction. Now, when you are um, writing these pieces for The New Yorker, just out of curiosity, do you come up with the piece that you're going to write? Or do they say, Casey, we want you to do a feature on this or that? Or do you submit your ideas? You know, what, what's your job like at The New Yorker? Yeah, that's a fun question. Um, and I guess it kind of goes both ways. I, I love Faulkner's work and I um, spent a lot of time in college reading Faulkner and um, I'm sure my editor knew that. So in this case, he said, you know, there's a new book coming out about Faulkner in the Civil War. And I've also been writing quite a bit about um, like a lot of people about civil war and about the civil war and about reconstruction and about the cultural memory of the civil war. And so he said, you know, there's a new book coming out about Faulkner and the civil war. Do you want to take a look at it? Um, and I read it. It's a very great book. Um, it's actually out already. If folks are interested in Faulkner, it's called um, The Saddest Words, um, William Faulkner's Civil War. It's by a Smith College professor named Michael Gora. 
And um, it's, it's a very interesting book. And if you're just looking, it's basically like taking a college class on Faulkner in the best possible way. I don't mean that in a like, oh, it's boring and you won't want to do the homework way. But like, if you've read those novels and you just want to step up your thinking and, you know, you can read them and learn a lot by reading them. But it's just someone who spent a lifetime teaching Faulkner walking you through and giving you this new way of thinking about them because the Civil War turns out to be like kind of both overly present and kind of conspicuously absent in Faulkner's work. He starts writing about it kind of late and um, almost exclusively in the novels set in Mississippi. Um, so that was an example of like, I think they, I think they knew I was just a real fan of Faulkner and I love Southern writers in general. You know, I wrote the book about Harper Lee and I've written about Flannery O'Connor and, um, James Baldwin and a couple of other folks where they know that's kind of a, a wheelhouse for me. So they asked, but um, with Marilyn Robinson, I, I remember I brought her up the, the day they hired me. <laughs> I said, you know, this is a, one of my favorite writers and you guys have never profiled her. So, you know, do you think that would make sense? And um, some ideas like that kind of go in their direction. I wrote a piece a while ago um, about historic preservation of African-American historical sites. And that was a piece that I had gotten really interested in. Um, there's a, for folks who might be looking for a day trip from St. Mary's, there's a lot of really interesting archeology span and history happening in Easton, the town where I went to high school. And they have, they have just learned in the last few years that um, the, the free black community in Easton, so it's a neighborhood called The Hill, is older than Treme. So that, that historically black neighborhood in New Orleans, which had rightfully gotten all of this attention because it was an interesting part of the city where formerly enslaved people, um, liberated people, free blacks, mulattoes had, had come together and you know there was a high rate of home ownership and they had built this community. Um, fascinatingly, there was an equivalent space in Easton and it's called The Hill and it has several African Methodist Episcopal churches and Buffalo soldiers who came home from the war bought houses there. And all the way back into the 18th century, there was black home ownership in this part of Easton. It's a wonderful, they're doing all of this great history and research. And so I had been following that and I had done a walking tour and met some of the archeologists working there. Um, but I got really interested in the fact that, you know, there's a Treme and there's a hill and there are all of these equivalent sites around the country. And I um, had interviewed a preservationist who was just helping through the National Trust to build up those local efforts. So, you know, if you found something like the Hill or Treme, you could go to the National Trust and they would help you do the research, apply for grants and build up the kind of infrastructure that it takes to mark historical sites and make walking tours and just promote it, you know, to do the work of public history. So that was an idea I took to them. I said, you know, this guy is fascinating. I think we should write about him. And the National Trust is doing all this fundraising. And so you would never know it if you read that piece that it grew out of, you know, there's like one paragraph about the hill in it but that was my way in. Um, so it goes both ways and I, I love getting ideas. I mean, frankly, the reason I love doing events like this is half the time someone raises their hand at the end of the event and they're like, have you ever read so-and-so? Or, you know, have you heard about such and such a place? And um, I, I think that's, you know, great ideas come from outside the world and outside, you know, if other people have already written about it, there's often not much more to say. Um, so I'm always looking for ideas, and I think that's true of the editors at The New Yorker, too. Um, so I, I take a lot of stuff to them, and they bring a lot of stuff to me. But book reviews often, you know, they're hearing from publishers about what's going to come out. I'm sure it's like the library, Joan. You guys get, you know, before your patrons know, six months out, you know kind of what's coming down the pipeline. So yes. they often flag things that are of interest to me, books about religion, books about the South, um, books about archaeology, kind of deep history. And um, those are the things that interest me. And so they're often kind of saying, are you interested in this? Or do you want to take a look at the book and see if you can build out a piece? Have you always worked from Easton instead of uh, where their headquarters are? They all, you've always worked remotely? Yeah, I, I live in Caroline County now, not far from my parents. And my family is all still in Talbot. But um, yeah, I, I have been very lucky and I feel quite blessed. I um, have been able to be a writer without ever moving to New York. You know, yeah. poor Harper Lee, even in 1949, knew if you wanted to be a writer, you had to go to New York. So she dropped out of Alabama and dro literally dropped out of the University of Alabama and moved to the big city. And I think one of the nice things about 
the age of the internet, there's so much to lament and to worry about and to, you know, moan and mourn. But um, it's been nice. I, I started as a freelancer and wrote for some other places too. But, um, and I, I mean, before the pandemic, I tried to get up there once or twice a year. I mean, I, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful office. They used to be in Times Square, but now they're in the World Trade Center building actually. Um, so I try to get up there, but no, I feel quite blessed that I, I've, I've always worked for them from the Eastern Shore. And, you know, they have writers around the world. They have a writer based in China. They have some folks based on the West Coast. Um, we have somebody actually down in Atlanta who I'm sure is about to get a lot of work with these Senate runoffs. You know, right. so they, they have people around the country. And I think that's good for the magazine. And I think that a lot of media outlets are kind of realizing that representation matters and it's another kind of diversity to take into account. And I feel like, you know, the Eastern shore is the, um, you know, the, the reddest part of Maryland in some ways. We have the only Republican in the congressional delegation at the federal level. And so I think that, you know, there, there's no such thing as too much diversity and to realize that life, you know, even with it, within a state like Maryland, certain parts of it are more conservative than other, others or culturally Southern in ways that other parts of it aren't, or just that kind of classic. And we're seeing it across the country, the urban rural divide, you know, for the first few months of the pandemic, I had trouble doing these Zooms because I don't have great internet. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I think in some ways it's really good that the New Yorker has a writer who is saying like, hello, school, work, all of this infrastructure is impossible for, you know, I was doing book events in the parking lot of the local high school. Yes. Because, you know, thankfully, Governor Hogan had made the priority Wi-Fi available at libraries and high schools around the state. And, you know, that's not, I, I am a very privileged person and I'm blessed to have, you know, a steady income. It had nothing to do with my financial assets. It was everything to do with the last mile, you know, the, the right. life of a lot of rural Americans, you know, it has nothing to do with your resources. It's just the availability of so much of our infrastructure and particularly right. the internet. So yeah, I've, I've always been lucky to be able to work remotely and I, I can't wait, you know, look, there are a lot of reasons to wish for the, for COVID to be over and for it to be safe to travel and be in groups again. But um, I, I love chasing stories wherever they are. So one of the nice things about being based on the shore too is it's not that I write about the Eastern Shore all the time. You know, I go and get to go to other parts of the country. And um, that that writer, Marilyn Robinson, I went and interviewed her out in Iowa. And that was a state I'd barely traveled to before and got to see some of the prairie and move around there. So I love to chase the story wherever it is. Yeah. Now, how... Speaking of that, I was very impressed with your book. If you went down to Alabama in 2015 when Go Set a Watchman was being published and you were able to get this book written in it, written and published by 2019, how did you go through all of the documents, figure out that you were going to write the book concentrically, put it all together? I mean, there must have been just paperwork upon paperwork how how I, and i know you have been quoted as saying it it really wasn't my research it was harper lee's research she she did the work i'm just kind of pulling it together it was something along those lines but it is so impressive that you were able to get your hands on these interviews and these family members and harper lee's letters all the things that you cite in your book and get this written and published in that amount of time. How did you, did you say to yourself, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to work for eight hours a day? You know, were you, did you tell the New Yorker, okay, you won't see me for three years. I'm going to lock myself in this room and, and spread all of these documents out. How did you do that? Yeah, that's a great question, but um, I love Joan that it's, it's coming from somebody who works for a library because I don't always get to do this, but of course, you know, a book is a book and it has one name on the cover, but I, I felt pretty strongly that the acknowledgments of this book would try to acknowledge the people who would help me do it. Um, and, you know, at the top of that list is, is librarians. And, you know, I cannot tell you from small regional libraries in Alabama. So, you know, there's a regional library, the Horseshoe Bend Regional Library near where these murders took place. And, 
you know, God bless the librarians there because they would open up the basement so I could go rooting around in their old newspapers and they would track down books for me. They would sit and listen to me and try to help me go through the phone book to figure out who might know something. At one point in time, they were pulling out, you know, church maps from the 1970s to try and help me figure out like what churches the reverend had preached at. And, you know, there are oh always God. experts in every field and the equivalent librarian at the Library of Congress, you know, they have all of these specialty librarians and there's a woman who gets her own shout out in the acknowledgements because I can't tell you the number of times I wrote to Heather Thomas, who's my librarian at the LOC to say, I don't know if you guys have it, but could you help me track down, you know, this random alumni magazine from 1959? And, you know, I gotta say 99% of the time she could, and it might've taken her two months to do it, or she might've said, you know, I found it in this library. So the next time you're in Georgia, you can go and they have the microfilm. You know, there are just experts and they're generous with their time. And I feel like, you know, a big part of this is public institutions. You know, these are librarians who are there for the public. And if you're trying to track down your family history or you're just interested in something, they love to help. And they know the resources they have, electronic or in person. And they're just there to help you. And I think that, you know, I, I take advantage of that a lot as a professional writer, but I, I always try to remind people that it's true, even if it's just, you know, your great aunt Sally used to live in Decatur and you call up the Decatur librarian and she's going to tell you, okay, in the Georgia room, we have these books and these histories and these are the oral histories we have. So maybe this person knew your great aunt and just a tremendous amount of resources. And, you know, I know a lot about Maryland, but I knew very little about Alabama. Right. And so I spent a lot of time at the state archives and, you know, just very smart people when you say, what are the five best books about Alabama? Or, you know, I'm interested in the Alabama court system. If you were me, what would you read? Or, you know, where do you think this kind of information is? So one of the ways I could do it so quickly is just, I, I think it's like, you know, if you get lost in a foreign city, you got to ask for help and you got to ask for directions. And half the time, you know, instead of going to the museum you thought you were going to go to, the local says, oh, don't go there. The better art collection is over here. So I think a lot of that expediency just comes from, you know, reaching out to librarians and archivists and, you know, it's same for human sources. You know, I think if you are candid with people and you're sincere and you come in the right spirit of wanting to get the story right and wanting to understand what happened, that often opens doors. And so somebody, maybe the person you thought knew something about Harper Lee's work on this case doesn't, but they give you five other names. Or they say, you know, I never really met her while she was here, but I remember so-and-so whose mom owned the dress shop really got to know her. And it's a little treasure hunt. You go from person to person or from book to book or, you know, retired newspaper writer to retired newspaper writer and it comes together and I always find that kind of stuff fun I love a treasure hunt I, I love a challenge and so those things I, I think are really what makes reporting fun so I like the job and I think that you know it felt like a long time to me with this book but obviously like to the people in Alabama who had been waiting for Harper Lee to publish her book since 1977 it was very quick <laughs> you know, 40 years had passed and they had been waiting to, you know, hear this story kind of put together like this. And so I, I felt like it was slow as molasses. And the longest thing I'd ever written before this was like my, you know, graduate thesis, which was like 30,000 words. So I felt like it took forever. But of course, there's always, you know, there's always someone else to compare yourself to as a writer or, you know, a similar book to yours that took 10 times as long. So you can always look back and not forward. But um, yeah, I think I spent about two and a half years kind of researching and writing and then delivered it to the publisher and went through a round of edits. Um, so it, it, it came out and it came together. But, um, you know, I also just think it takes as long as it takes. And, you know, Plenty of people spend 10 years on a novel or 30 years on a novel or 15 years on a nonfiction manuscript and it's worth it. And somebody asked me earlier, like, what do you learn by talking to other writers? I think the kind of major thing I've learned is no two people do it the same way. And mm -hmm. just because somebody else wrote their true crime book in one kind of structure or, you know, they um, wrote it in a certain amount of time or they went with this editor or this publisher, there are so many roads to Rome that it's interesting to see other people's, but I, I just don't think you should ever despair. And, you know, frankly, Harper Lee is a great example of that. Like there yeah. is a version of Harper Lee's story where Ghost had a Watchman got rejected and she like moved back to Alabama and worked at the country club, you know, <laughs> but instead 
she met this editor who said, you know, let's revise. And two and a half years is a long time to be revising and, you know, to be despairing about will it ever be done? Will it ever be good? Will they ever publish it? And we see the rewards of that patience in Mockingbird. You know, it is such a beautiful book, so much better than Watchmen. Right, right. I agree. Now, you mentioned in this book that Tom Radney's family, a lot of the people that lived in the town, they wanted this book published. They knew that Harper Lee was writing it or they thought she was working on it. They were very, they would do anything that they could to help her. When you went there to report on Ghosts at a Watchman, did you think right away, hey, I'll make friends with these people and I'll write this book or... You know, how, how did they find out that you had made the decision, you were going to write this book, how, yeah. how you know, uh, and no. helping you? The answer is no, not at all. I mean, I was fascinated by the Maxwell case, and I thought I was just going to tuck it into the first article I wrote for The New Yorker. Okay. That, didn't, that didn't make sense because I was already kind of long, and it was focused on Watchmen, and it was focused on the... Um, in particular, the lawyer who had taken over Harper Lee's affairs. And it was much more about the kind of um, ethics of publishing that book. And, but I said to my editor, you know, I found this like other great story and maybe two weeks went by and I said, you know, could I write another article? You know, if we put it on the website, could I write another article? I think it's fascinating. I think like nobody's heard about it. Like I found all these, I'd already started to kind of talk to other people who had met her when she was in town and um, some documents had started to materialize. And so you know, I said, can I write about it? And I kind of thought that would be the end of it. You know, I'd never written a book. And the very last line of that article that I wrote for the New Yorker about the Maxwell case is literally, you know, the Radney family is, you know, um, the Radney family is like disappointed Harper Lee never wrote the book, but sanguine that someone else might. That's like literally the end of that piece. And, you know, I was just, I, I, I love writing. I'm a pretty happy writer. I was happy to be done. At that time I was freelancing for the New Yorker. So it was truly like, you know, notching up bylines to like pay my car bill and my health insurance. And like, I'd gone to the dentist a few months before that I can remember. And I was like trying to pay down the dental debt. And so it was just done and I was happy to be done. And, you know, kind of right away, people who were reading that article said, why don't you write it? Oh you know, and just like, you know, to state the obvious, like, it sounds like you're really interested in this case. And then it turned out one of those people was the Radneys. You know, they just said, you know, and, and I started to hear from people when it came out and they started to hear from people who had known Tom and different people who knew Harper Lee kind of came forward. And, you know, I wrote the article because it seemed like there was enough to write an article, but very quickly more and more material emerged. And I feel like that's the standard for a book is, you know, you don't need very much to write a 2,000 word article and you don't even need that much to write an 8,000 word article. But when you're talking about a 100,000 word book, you really got to make sure you've got sources and source material and that there's something new to say and that there's going to be a kind of payoff for pursuing it at that length. Um, and for me, that was really the number of humans who came out of the woodwork. Like one of the um, coroners who had done some of the autopsies reached out to me and someone who had been at the funeral home reached out to me when the reverend was gunned down and a friend of Harper Lee's reached out to me to say you know I remember talking to her about this case and some letters of hers like the letters she wrote to Gregory Peck materialized and I hadn't seen those before and they mentioned the Maxwell case and so little by little it just seemed like there's a body of material here that I could work on at book length. And by that time I was interested in all three of the characters. So the other thing I wasn't sure I wanted to do was like write a straight biography because there had been one 10 years earlier. Right. Um, but, you know, there was this other way to do it. And, you know, again, I love religion. So I felt like with the Reverend, there was this religious history and I love political history. And so with Tom, I felt like, okay, it was already, you know, we were building up to the 2016 election. So I was thinking, you know, all of these deep currents of American history and race relations and, political change, especially in the state of Alabama, were, were kind of bubbling to the surface. And so I felt like I didn't want to write about the present day, but I could write about the 1950s and the 1960s, and that might be illuminating for the present day. Um, but no, I really, when I wrote that article, I was just like happy to have another article done. <laughs> it, was not, it was not a like, oh, is this, you know, are these training wheels for a book? Um, but I, I feel like now I have a better sense of kind of what might be a good idea for a book. And so like my next book, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to write about it in journalism form until the book is done, um, 
which I don't think I, I could not see my way to a book with furious hours. It took writing the article to kind of look around the room and okay. identify enough sources. That I, I just, do you look back now and say, wow, I'm an author. How did this happen? Oh my gosh. Every time we do one of these, are you kidding? Like half the time when I, you know, when I used to do these in person and I would like look down at the book, it's like you, I, I think anybody who's pursued a, you know, kind of artistry, even for fun, it's like the first time you see your painting on the wall in someone else's house or a photograph in a magazine. Um, no, half the time I still look at the book and have the disassociation of like, oh my gosh, it's my name on the cover. Right. So no, I feel really lucky. And, you know, I said I, I'm interested in regionalism and place. And um, the other thing that's just surreal to me is what a gift to be able to go spend, you know, a long period of time in another state and get to know people who live there and read deeply about their history and I just feel like, you know, I was following this Senate race in Alabama. Doug Jones was running for re-election. And, you know, I, I knew people who had worked on his campaign. And, you know, I was watching those debates with Tommy Tuberville unfold and, you know, following the primary in Alabama. Just the political and the cultural life of a place comes alive for you. I mean, I follow Alabama football games now, which is just not something I ever thought I would do. And, you know, apologies if any of the Auburn folks who talk to me for the book are listening. I, I haven't quite turned to following Auburn games, but, you know, you just get to know another part of the world. And that feels like, you know, even if the book had never been finished, had never been published, you know, if the publisher decided they weren't going to publish it, I just feel like it's such a gift to get to know another part of the world. And, other people in it. So that was really special for me too. You know, two and a half years is a long time to be interviewing people. And, you know, you, you feel like you know them after a couple of hours, but, you know, by the end of it, I, I think sources often can become really close friends. And there are just some people in the book who are very near and dear to me. And a couple of people in the book have passed away. And, you know, that's just another part of life. They were old when I met them. And I was lucky that, you know, we intersected for the time that we did. And um, I, I just feel like that's another part of it that's special. You know, even if there were never a byline on the book or a jacket that had my name on it, the opportunity to spend time down there was its own gift. Well, you make that part I mean, having the the interviews and the people, the contacts, that that's one part of it, but being able to put all the information that you have in this book together mm. is it's fascinating. It's, the, you know, I was saying to you earlier, it's almost like we need a genealogy sheet to keep track of who was here when, what year was the book published, what year was Gregory Peck picked as the actor for yeah, the yeah. Which, you know, I mean, you make it sound easy, but to, to get all that onto paper, like, were you pulling your hair out sitting there at the time, and, you know, at, the, at your computer putting this together? Yeah, I mean, not quite, but I will say, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a really visual learner. You were telling me you listen to this as an audio book, and I, I love listening to audio books, but I don't retain information that way. Like, I really do have to, like, see the person and listen to them or like lay out the documents. And, um, you know, I love computers and they're real gifts, but I'm old school. I print things out. They go into a file folder. They go into a banker's box. And um, I, I think at one point when my, I live very near where my parents live and my father had come over to help me with something. And, you know, he went into the room where I worked on the book and the wall was taped with all of the timelines. Like, you know, the Reverend was on one wall, Tom Radney was on another, and there was all this Harper Lee stuff taped to the wall. And I do just think he had the moment of like, this is either going to go really well or really poorly. Like she's either almost off the deep end or almost done. But I think those kinds of organizational tools are really useful. And some right. people are able to do it digitally. I know I have some friends who use um, programs like... Um, something called Scrivener and right. um, heard that. There, are, there are programs, you know, if you're someone who's interested in writing a book and you feel like you need those tools, they exist digitally. Um, I, I really think, you know, there is nothing better than a legal pad and, right. and nothing finer than a piece of scotch tape on the wall. Right, right. Like you can lay it out and you can put things in order. And oftentimes all that does is reveal to you the holes you still need to fill in. Um, but I do think it's useful. And, um, you know, if you've done it right, your readers can just kind of enjoy the ride. Um, but, you know, we were talking about this too. On the other hand, that's why nonfiction books often have maps or they have timelines right. or they have a genealogical chart of who's related to whom and, you know, the different generations of things. So, yeah, well, true, I, I love it. It's like a true detective show, you know, when you're in the police precinct and they're 
they're documenting a murder. That's what they have. Everything is on the wall. Who did what? Here's a picture of the first suspect, the second suspect. Yeah. There's yeah. a writer I really like. Um, if folks, uh, probably if folks have already read him, but um, Gay Talese, who, you know, is a master of new journalism and, you know, was probably the most famous thing he ever wrote was um, Frank Sinatra as a cold. He wrote for Esquire for a while and he did these big profiles and he wrote a lot of books, but Gay Talese's father was a tailor. And as he was growing up, you know, the thing he would outline and like write his notes on were these um, cardboard pocket holders. You know, they would go into the shirts when they were pressed or when they were cut. And um, some of the larger, like, you know, the chest fold cardboard sheets, these like, you know, eight and a half by 11, but he outlined everything that way. And he and the other writer I love, John McPhee, if you go and look at what those guys do, I mean, they have the craziest diagrams and the zaniest like outlines. and. I've never done anything quite that crazy, but I understand why visually it's useful to organize your information. And I kind of have to do that before I start writing. You know, I can't, I, I can hold a lot of information in my head, but I have to see how it's going to work before I can start writing. So I'm a big outline person and I like to organize my notes and my interviews and the books that I've read. I, you know, put them on different shelves or kind of think through chronologies. So I, I have to kind of scaffold my work that way. And I think a lot of great writers do. Marilyn Robinson, for instance, that woman we were talking about before, doesn't do any kind of outlining. She just writes and finds her way through and she doesn't revise very much, but I, I, I'm not that good. I have to outline and make notes and organize things like that in order to get anywhere. Well, you know, there are plenty of people out there that want to write their, either their autobiography or their first novel. And I know that they're curious for you to have written your first book and it's a New York Times bestseller. People probably think, okay, what was the trick? What was the, um, you know, what, what did you do differently from what they may have been doing? So I think I mean, that's if interesting. I, if I appreciate I you sharing that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I knew, if I knew the trick, I mean, frankly, if the publishers knew the trick, everything they'd publish would be a bestseller. I guess, you know, the honest answer is you just don't know. And I have a friend, he's a writer at The New Yorker, Philip Gravich, and Philip wrote a beautiful book about Rwanda that um, if folks haven't read. It's a masterful book, and it's, it's a, it's a very, it was important coverage of that conflict when it was happening. And Philip has continued to follow Rwanda, but everybody knows that book by Philip, but nobody really knows his second book. And it's just as good. It's about a cold case um, in, in New York, but Philip's book came out the week of September 11th. And, you know, nobody was reading new books the week of September 11th. And it just, you know, meaning if publishers knew how to do it, they'd do it every time. <laughs> it's really yeah. just, you know, you feel lucky if anybody reads your book, much less a, a large number of them. Well, I think that is what has helped me as a librarian. Now that everything is uh, virtual, I was lucky enough to attend the Library Journal's virtual day of dialogue. And they had all of their authors who would have been on the road promoting yeah. their books in you know, bookshops, which we don't have a lot of down in St. Mary's County or in big auditoriums. You know, they, they put their authors on the road to sell these books and I don't get to hear them, but since they did everything virtually, and of course the library day, the library journal's day of dialogue is in Chicago every year, and we don't get to go to that. Yeah. It was all virtual. So to be able to hear all of these authors was fascinating. And and that, yeah, that's I, something new for me. I hope that some of these, you know, look, it is it is a gift to gather in person, and you know, there are real reasons that every religious tradition has worship as a part of it, you know, coming together, things happen when we're all in the same room. But on the other hand, I do hope, you know, libraries, bookstores, cultural institutions, I do hope they retain some of this virtual stuff because I know someone who typed a question mentioned that for disability reasons, they couldn't capitalize things. You know, I assume yes. they were using um, transcription software. And, you know, I just think that we can always be more mindful and we can always be more generous. And I mentioned being on rural internet, you know, I feel like growing up, you know, DC was not that far. Frankly, New York City isn't that far from the Eastern Shore, but it felt like Mars to me. 
Right. And, you know, I think we can, I hope we retain some of these accessibility options because there are a lot of people, a lot of seniors who are homebound, who can't go to an event or, you know, resource wise, maybe they don't have the money to get gas to go right. miles. Exactly. And so I do think that is one of the kind of silver linings of this is realizing we can do more to invite other people in and that, yeah. right, just because you don't have a bookstore nearby doesn't mean you can't take part in a book discussion. So right. it's so nice of you all to do it. And I, I really do appreciate it. And nice of folks to give up their, you know, Monday night to hang out, but um, nice of the library too, to invest in the infrastructure and make it available. Well, before we let you go, I have one more question that I keep seeing and I keep talking too much. This one is also from JD and she said, do you do genealogy as well? Uh, she said you were describing how genealogists work. So she was just curious. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, the truth is I wish I did it better. Um, I take advantage of kind of a lot of the same resources that genealogists do, um, you know, whether it's find a grave or ancestry.com or newspapers.com to go through old obituaries to kind of track down sources. And so I think that journalists, especially when they're working on historical sources, have to take advantage of those same tools. And, you know, I do make my kind of anecdotal genealogical charts to figure out, you know, oh, does this person have any survivors? Oh, did, you know, they didn't have children. Do they have nieces and nephews? Can I build out a family tree to find someone who could give me some kind of oral history or tell me what happened to their estate? So I, I wish I were better at it. And occasionally I've reached out, um, for help or consulting from professionals, but um, I use all those resources all the time. And I'm grateful to folks, you know, the truth is you're lucky sometimes, a lot of times the work's been done for you and people are piecing to find a grave. There's a lot of volunteers going out to track down the headstones and map out the relationships between people in a cemetery. And I have benefited same as librarians or archivists, you know, that kind of genealogical work is invaluable. And a couple of times in Alabama with these rural counties, like a lot of this took place in Coosa County, which is one of the most rural and one of the poorest counties in Alabama. But there were, you know, there was a historical heritage group that had done a lot of oral histories and put together a heritage book. And a couple of just, you know, local family histories that when someone bothered to do the work, they donated a copy to the library. So when I wanted to research Coosa County, I could pull out those books and it wasn't like I was writing about that particular family, but to be able to read about what life was like in 1920 and 1930 and 1940 in that place, for me as a journalist was really valuable. Um, so I, I'm grateful to the work amateur and professional his genealogists do and historians do. And um, I feel like kind of wherever I go for a story, one of my first stops is the local library because I want to go to that Maryland room or that, you know, St. Right. Mary's room and figure out, you know, what resources are there? Because I, I love looking to the past. A lot of what I do is about history. Um, so I, I'm grateful. And, you know, city directories and those kinds of repositories of information that the library, hopefully when people bother to do that work for their own family, they do make a kind of public record out of it because yeah. of you never know who's interested in your family for what reason. Like, you know, at one point I was trying to track down people who had served on juries in 1970. You know, you are, you know, but for the grace of God, you can even get their names, much less learn, you know, what job they had. And those little details bring a, a book like mine to life and they help you track down, you know, it might be somebody's second cousin, but they've got a great memory that slots right into the book. So I, I'm grateful to folks who do it and, and folks who've taken time to kind of talk me through the resources, especially online that, that you can use. All right, so I have one more question and this is my question, then I'll let you go. <laughs> You mentioned in the book that the Radneys had given Harper Lee, or actually Tom Radney had given Harper Lee a valise full of his papers and that they had not gotten the, the valise back and that you were there when the valise was returned to the family, it sounded like. Yeah. Were you able, did they let you have access to all of these papers? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, did you go home with all of them? Thing. Yeah, yeah, let me add one tiny thing to my answer to, I think JD was asking about genealogy, and I just want to recommend a book if you're interested in genealogy. It's going to come out in 2022, um, and Joan, you can make a note because you should have her do one of these events. It will be very interesting to folks who are trying to piece together their own family history. Um, her name is Maud Newton, M-A-U-D, Maud, and the book is called Ancestor Hunger. 
Okay. And um, she wrote an article you can read right now for Harper's about the genealogy craze. And, you know, when 23andMe and these DNA companies were getting started and Ancestry.com, you know, all of these digital resources, that's a big part of Maud's story. But she tells you how she pieced together her own family history. She's a friend of mine. I just read an early manuscript copy and it's really interesting. And I think like she's looking at the science of the DNA stuff, but she's also looking at the cultural stuff of, you know, how people are making sense of this all. So um, that's a great book. And I, I think it's really smart about a lot of these deep questions about how much we can ever know and what it means in our relationship to our, um, you know, biological past. But um, to answer your question, Joan, yeah, I mean, kind of the most exciting, I think a lot of working on this book was exciting, but probably the most exciting day was um, the Radneys called me. I was up in Maryland, you know, I was home, I was writing. It's kind of late in the book process. And they called and said they had heard from Harper Lee's estate. And did I want to come with them to Monroeville to pick up what was being returned to them? And they didn't exactly know what it was. You know, who knew how much she'd kept or what had happened to it or what was being handed back to them. And um, yeah, I went, Tom's got three daughters and a son. And I went with one of the daughters and, you know, we walked into the Lee family law firm and they hand over this giant briefcase. You're right to use the word valets. And um, I was really lucky because what they let me do is just, you know, piece by piece photograph every page of the material and go through it. And, you know, I think it was a rewarding experience for them because they knew all the bits that were about their father or their grandfather because a couple of grandkids were there. So the things that had his handwriting or, you know, his intake forms, they knew how that worked in the law office. But, you know, a lot of it was the ins and outs of the Maxwell case, which by that time I was the expert on, you know, oh, oh, this is the, you know, indictment from 1970. He was indicted for this or, oh, these are the mortgage papers from 1968 and the Platt deeds. And, you know, I think it was interesting for them to hear all of the kind of legal history of the documents, which were not as meaningful to them as the kind of human history. And right. then mixed in were some of the Harper Lee portions where, you know, the page of notes I mentioned, that's the epilogue of the book. One of the things that was in that briefcase was a page of Harper Lee's notes, which are exactly like the notes she made for Capote out in Kansas. And if you, if you go to New York City, you can go to the New York Public Library and you can see her notes from Kansas. You know, you can look at everything she typed up for Truman Capote to help him write in cold blood. And, you know, the moment we saw that page of notes, I knew right away what it was. And of course, for them, they were like, well, who's, who's, who's this person? Who is it? And I said, well, it's Mary Lou Maxwell's sister. So that's the first Mrs. Maxwell, 1978. It's Harper Lee. She's still in town. She's interviewing that lady. You know, I, it's, people are experts at different things. And of course, there was a family history for them, but they're not kin to the Maxwells. And, you know, Tom's lawyering had been his own legal work. Um, so I think it was a lot of fun. They had things to teach me. I had things to teach them. But yes, in terms of the kind of journalistic gods, for me, it was great. They let me handle everything, take all the pictures I needed. You know, we were up until like one in the morning that night, which again, God bless them. They could have kicked me out at 10 and said, we're done. This is boring. Move on. But page by page, you know, what was in it? Where did it come from? What did it look like? So I was very lucky. And yeah, that's the epilogue because it was actually really pivotal to the book to confirm so much of what I had suspected about her reporting and what people had told me in their interviews, but then to have the physical pages to kind of attest to all that. Well, and what you don't mention is that at the time, well, you mentioned you were in Maryland, which meant you had to fly down to Alabama to get there to the do that. Yeah, yeah. Right. I love the drive. Yeah, that was, I mean, I'll tell you, I don't think I ever made my way down 95 faster than that trip because <laughs> I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't that they were in a hurry. You know, they were going to wait for me to go to Monroeville, which is two and a half hours from where they live. But I was just dying to know what the heck was in it. It's like Christmas, you know, Christmas Eve, you're looking at the package. And you just want it to be, you know, early enough that your parents will come down and let you open it. So yes, I hightailed it down there and we went, I think we picked it up on a Friday and then a couple of them wanted to be there when we went through. So Saturday afternoon into the evening, we went through page by page what was in it. So a lot of fun. And I, um, there's some pictures of different things in the book. Some of those, um, life insurance certificates, you know, that's a photo. I had found copies of some of the, but Harper Lee had copies of even more of the reverend's policies. So you see a lot of it and I describe it. And I do think, you know, it was a lot of fun for me as a reporter, but it's a lot of what went into the book too. Well, I love how you make everything look so easy. Oh, I just showed up, you know, they, they, they shared the paperwork with me, you know, it's, you're, you're amazing that the book was fantastic. 
Well, I really appreciate it. It's, it's always fun to meet someone who reads the book carefully and thoughtfully, and it's been, been a lot of fun to talk to you about it. Can you give us a hint as to what your next book is about? Oh man, that's so far off. It wouldn't <laughs> be a hint, it would be a tease. Um, okay. But I think probably the next thing that will come out is that Faulkner piece. And um, if you like Faulkner, I mean, the other thing that was great about that was you know, forget what my next book is. If you haven't read Faulkner since high school or college, or if you've never read it, you know, there has never been a better time to pick up Absalom, Absalom, or The Sound and the Fury, or As I Lay Dying. I just, forget about Casey Sepp's next book, go back and read Faulkner. Okay. <laughs> it's a you're, you're very challenging, humble. maddening thing to sit with, but um, truly, I mean, Mockingbird is prescient, but the Faulkner books really are too. And I think it's, they, they met their cultural moment when they came out, but they are just as resonant today. And if you want something, I, I think she's complicated in her own way, but the other thing I'd say is go and read one of Marilyn Robinson's novels. Okay, well, I, I just have to one say- One of her books would be worth whatever I write in my whole lifetime. So skip me and just, you know, sit down with one of her novels. I, I have all this scribble here. So if I if I send you an email and I say, okay, like, what yeah, this, yeah. what's the last name of this yeah. author? You'll understand. And I bet, I'm sure the library has it all for folks listening, you know, the library is your best friend and they've got all of the digital resources too. I know I borrow ebooks and audio books through the library a lot and never, never forget that they're your best friend in a pandemic and any other time. Well, I like what you have reiterated is, you know, right now we think everything has to be digital, but you have definitely emphasized the fact that real people helped you write this book. And, oh, absolutely. And yeah. that, that warms my heart because, you know, you, you were in buildings, you were in basements, you were, people were handing you phone books. You know, I'm the same way as you. I like to have everything in front of me. I like to have my notes. I don't, I don't yeah. like to do everything digitally. As, I mean, I do listen to the books a lot on audio and that's wonderful because I'm in the car all the time or, you know, I can carry my cell phone around the house now and listen to a book, which is great. But um, I, I like how you reiterate the fact that, and, and JD has said the same thing, libraries matter. And Oh, and that's, yeah, I try not to evangelize too much because, of course, the evangelist in the book turns out to be like a serial killer. So you <laughs> tread lightly. But yeah, I do. I do try and just remind people whether it's, you know, the White Rabbit bookstore, we just or the library, we just have real choices about where to spend our money and what to invest in. And, you know, libraries, local stores, small businesses the internet makes it so easy to consolidate our spending and to, you know, spend money in some other state or some other country. But I, I think especially now, you know, being mindful of our neighbors and their businesses and, and libraries and real institutions that are there for us all um, is just so important. And, you know, well, you guys are proving your worth every day. You're, I'm laughing because last week I had, like I told you, I had listened to this book on audio and my, um, rental, if you want to call it, ran out. So they're like, you don't have the book anymore. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm in the best part. So I ran over to the White Rabbit and I just have to share this with everybody. They had the author uh, signature. So I've got my own son oh, there you copy, go. and I feel very special. So there you go. So thank you, Casey, so much. And yeah, if you ever so want to Join us again. If you have an article you'd like to talk about or anything, just let us know. Oh, we'll gosh, sure thing. Well, I, I'll hope and pray it's in person next time. Yes, yes. Yeah, you guys are so far. And I was talking about love and archaeology, but obviously St. Mary's has got some of the most interesting archaeology in the state. So I've been dying for a reason to come back. I haven't been, I haven't been to the excavation sites probably since I was in high school. So it'd be nice to have a reason to come back. Oh, we would love to have you back anytime, anytime. So, oh, and then you can, we'll give you a tour of the new library. So that would oh, be- Oh yeah, well, thanks so much. You guys stay right. safe. Thank you, you too. Take care. And thank you everybody for joining us this evening.